good afternoon, everyone. Everybody still happy? Okay. Jesus gives us peace and we have joy in our lives. And that's a wonderful thing coming from uh, our God, right? And that's why we, we, I did it again. I didn't put the mic on. <laughs> I don't think about it hardly anymore, do I? All right. Now, that's better, right? Okay. <laughs> Want to be heard. Like a trumpet, let it sound. Okay? The word of God needs to go out to mankind so that they can see that there's a reality in serving him the only true God who made heaven and earth. So my subject today is adversaries and adversity. You don't know anything about that? Adversaries and adversity. In life we have many situations and issues to face and deal with. And we must look for uh, growth to conclude each situation rather than allow it to be uh, to become weak in the, to us to become weak in the faith and give in to the ways of this world. One of the things we will face is adversity, and it may come from others. And uh, if so, then you have just faced an adversary. An adversary, okay? And that's important to know that the Scripture does speaks about adversaries and those that oppose you. Now, as we all know, God is the first one who faced adversity from an adversary that came from Satan himself. We'll look at that in Isaiah, the 14th chapter, verse 12 through 15. The first one who decided to begin rebel against God and his righteousness and truth. Now, let's see, did I say verse 12? Okay. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground. That's what happens to adversaries. They are cut down by those, uh, by the one who is in charge. That's the ruler, and that's God. Huh? He cut him down to the ground. Ye who weaken the nations. Do you understand how that happens? He gets into the minds of the leaders, and the leaders mess everything up for you. And he gets into the hearts and minds of, the, uh, uh, of those that are supposed to protect and help you and serve. And uh, they mess things up sometimes. And, and then in the people themselves. They let the devil work in their hearts and minds, giving them ideas that they can um, uh, do what they want to do and become a weak nation. And that's why we're, we're always striving to look to God, the author and finisher of our faith, and not uh, try to run off do on tangents, doing our own thing. And, but verse 13 says, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Above all. See? I will also sit on a mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And I will be like the most high. You want to be like the most high. They really want to take his place. Uh -huh. Yet you shall be brought down to, in the New King James Version, it says, Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. That's a grave. So eventually, this person who challenged God in all his righteousness will be judged. Right? So for him trying to grab all of the things that he wanted, found in his heart to desire, 
And the scripture clearly tells us that we are enticed in the sin by our own lust. So he had a lust and a desire to have what was not his. Even though he had a particular position, right? He wasn't happy with that. He was appointed. So he, was, he had a glorious position, right? But that wasn't good enough for him. He wanted to covet something that he could not have. And we as human beings, we're, we're enticed to have things that we shouldn't have due to lust and desires of the flesh. And so we become adversaries also because when we are enticed by our lust, it draws us to do what? Sin. And that's what that devil did. He sinned. Right? And when sin comes in, we bring ourselves into bondage and sorrow and shame. And we, above that, become what? An adversary. All right, so if I come into the church and I come up with different doctrines and teachings that we should not have because it's not in the scripture, right? I become an adversary if I advocate for these doctrines and things that I want to be in the church. See? No, this should not be. Don't be an adversary. Notice that Lucifer was operating in the mind of King. Um, did I finish that? No, I will also say, no, yeah, you will be brought down to Sheol. Okay. Notice that Lucifer was operating in the mind of the king of Babylon. We need to resist Lucifer because the king of Babylon didn't do that. All who are led by him will be judged as an adversary just like he will. Not a friend, but a foe. This can cause uh, this to happen. So this is uh, to Lucifer who ruled the king of who? Tyre. He was the king of Tyre. And it's found in Ezekiel 28, verse 15. He operated in the heart and mind of the king who let him in because he did... He had his own desires and whatnot, and so the devil said, yes, go, go forth and do that. You see, but in dealing with the king of Tyre, it actually was Lucifer because he was the one operating there, okay, in his heart and mind. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till what? Iniquity was found in you, and that did not come from God. It was found in him because of his own lustful desires to have what he should not have. That's really strange that, you know, that you can have, a, let's say for, say for instance, a corporation, and you have the management and whatnot, they're doing their duties, and then you have somebody lower on a lower earth salon, and he desires to have the management position. So he's going to come over and do some things and say some things that's going to elevate him. And if you come in by, by trickery and stealth and uh, convince others to go along with him, he said, you know, so that elevate himself. All right? Usually when something like that happens, he becomes a tyrant himself. He wants to remove other people from the top position, put himself there, and then he operate like he wants to. See? And that's what the devil does. He brings you problems. He brings you sorrow and shame. Because honestly, he does not really care about you. He only cares for himself. So... Do we still reap what you sow? Yes, yes, you do. He has a harvest to reap himself, okay, when he is judged. So, 
Now, at one time, let me see you. It says that he was at one time perfect. That means he was without blemish before God. Then iniquity was found in him, so he became lawless. Then he went against the law of God and righteousness and truth. A lawless person. So a person who is not bound by law is a person who is bound for by whatever he thinks or whatever he wants. Now, God is the lawgiver. And he lives and abides by his own laws. Right? But we know how mankind is. What do they do? The law is for you, not for me. Isn't that, that's how Lucifer is. He turned against righteousness. Right? So mankind do the same thing. He said, the law is for you, not for me. Right? We know about that because well, what is it that the um, people in the federal government can do? What can they do? They can do inside the trading. But you can't. There's a law against you. <laughs> they can, but they can, they can do it. See, so the, that law is for you, not for me, see? That's how man operates. But we should hold them, hold them accountable and make them change that law so they couldn't do no insider trading. They're up there making money and bringing problems upon the citizens. I won't go into that. <laughs> the definition of adversary, one of the actual Hebrew words, when you check it out, there's, I think I found two of them. I didn't keep going. I wanted to find out if they used the word Satan, and it's there, okay? The Hebrew, Satan, an opponent or foe, one that speaks against another with, uh, as a complaint, an enemy, and especially the devil. That's from Eaton's Bible Dictionary, especially the devil. Now, also, um, the definition of adversity, a state of or instance of serious or continued difficulty or misfortune. These are some of the things we can bring upon ourselves and others can bring it upon us. And, you know, just the different wear and tear of life, you know, going through life, certain things happen, you know. So here's a plea for relief from oppressors. Let's go to Psalm 74. This was the time, as I believe they, it was said uh, by Matthew Henry that this is the time of the destruction of, of Jerusalem and the temple by Nebuchadnezzar. Israel was in distress and anguish God was angry with them. So he let the enemy have his way. Psalm 74, verse 1 through 12. Here we go. Oh God, why have you cast us off forever? It seemed like that, huh? <laughs> One day just seemed like forever when you're in anguish and turmoil. Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pastor? Now, you know good and well that God would not allow that to have that happen unless they had done something. See, and this is a punishment going forward. So you want to know why, why? Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, the tribe of your inheritance, which you have redeemed. This Mount Zion, where you have dwelt, lift up your feet to the perpetual uh, desolations. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. And so the temple was also hurt during this time, right? Your enemies roar in the midst of your uh, meeting place. They set up their banners for signs. They seem like men who lift up axes among the thick trees. Y'all know how, to, how the difference between using a, a, a little knife, 
So you can all, only make a little small dent in the tree, right? So if you're using the ax, you can really chop that tree down in less time with a lot of strength and fervor. So here are these people, the enemies of God, is like tr uh, trees being cut down with an ax. That's, that's, very, that's very, I, I like how the Bible uses all of these different uh, symbols and whatnot. I'd just be trying to figure them out. <laughs> but yeah, the enemy has power and they have desolated the area. And it's like using the ax at the tree and cutting it down. And now they break down its carved work all at once with axes and hammers. They have set fire to your sanctuary. They have defiled the dwelling place of your name to the ground. Maybe because they don't care about that, see? The people who care about it, they can just sit around and watch. Because the, this punishment is going forth. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them all together. They have burned up all the meeting places of God in the land. We do not see our signs. There's no longer any prophet. Wonder where they went. <laughs> they probably grabbed the prophets first and, and all of the uh, leaders of the nation and called them to a meeting and locked them up in chains. All right. If they didn't actually put their eyes out or kill them. See, those are the first people who have to be handled because if you chop off the head of the nation, then the rest of the people don't know what to do except follow them, right? Nor is there any among us who knows how long. Oh God, how long will the adversary reproach until God is satisfied? That's, that, that's how long he'll reproach. Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? You know what he's talking about, the right hand? That's God's power that comes from the right hand. And remember, in the occult world, they have the left hand path, right? But God has the right hand path, and it's a path of power, right? And strength and might. Because all power is in his hand. Take it out of your bosom and destroy them. Yeah? Well, I think it's all right for you to pray, but you need to humble yourself before God, before God will move to handle these people. And that's what Israel had to do. They needed to humble themselves before God. For God is my king from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. So they acknowledged him, but what did they do wrong? That God decided to allow these things to happen to Jerusalem and the temple. Yeah. They did something. But if you trust God, he will help you rather than allow things to happen to you to the, uh, your anguish. We're going to go through some suffering. Jesus himself went through some things. But that was a wonderful thing that he did. But let's go to Isaiah 50, verse 7 through 9. Yeah, we must, as a nation, even America today, need to submit themselves to God. And watch out for the leaders that we have because if they thumb their nose at God, then the, uh, they're bearing the responsibility for what has come upon the nation. Be careful. Isaiah 50, verse 79. For the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. He is near who justifies me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my 
adversary, let him come near me. You know, come and bring your accusation or whatever it is you have. I will still be victorious over you. Why? Because God is with me. See? You don't have to be afraid of adversaries or evil people who will come and attack you in any manner, shape, or form. Surely the Lord God will help me. Who is who? Who is he who will con condemn me? Indeed, they will all grow old like a garment, and the moth will eat them up. And God is going to bless his own people. So that we don't have to be afraid or worried. And know that, you know, we, we're going to have adversaries. And we're going to have adversity. So don't be afraid. Don't get weak in the knees. Stand up before God. And God will lift you up and help you to be victorious over all the adversity that you have to face in life. So when an enemy would attack you, you can trust in God that everyone, everything will be all right. You might lose a few battles, but you will win the war. Huh? So can America be strong and win all of its um, battles? Yes. That's if God is with us. Can America lose some battles? Yes. If God is with us, we will win them all. Right? If not, we will not win all of our wars. What war did we run from? Vietnam. We didn't finish that. Okay. And let us know that something was wrong with that. At least that's what I believe. And depending on our devotion to God, we will see what our future will be. Remember to trust God. He can and will make a way for victory. So what is the a responsibility of the church? Let's go to Matthew 5, verse 25 and 26. Matthew 5. Now, if somebody has an accusation against you, and uh, even if it's right or wrong, if they have the ac accusation, then you deal with it in a certain way so that the, the, the situation can be held, handled. And if you are going to be exonerated, you know, be exonerated. But again, if you have to pay, then pay, right? So that's what this is saying. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are in the way with him lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. You see? And when the judge hand out the sentence, then you have to deal with it the best way you can. The judge had you, hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Right or wrong now, they have proved their case against you. Remember, there are a lot of people that are in jail right now, locked up, and they are innocent. But most of them are not. So that the innocent, we hope that they'll be set free and the guilty, you know, be found and pay their own penalties. But again, if they have a case against you and they come up with a proof and then the judgment goes against you, then you will pay all. Right? Surely I say to you, you will be, uh, by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny or to pay the whole price of what your sentence was. So I, I tell people you know, all the time, you know, try to keep your nose clean. That's a figure of speech. Keep your light straight and, 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 and striving to always do what is right so that when people do come up with accusations against you, everybody will be saying, well, this is not possible. He didn't do something like that. And you know, a lot of times parents will say, you know, 
My child wouldn't do nothing like that. Some of them be wrong, you know, but pretty much, if you have the right character, you're letting your light shine before the world, and, and they can see that you are a, a person, you're an upstanding citizen. You're, you're trying to live right, and you've been a, a blessing and help the people. They're going to stand up for you. Yes, they will. I, I'd, probably, I'd stand up for, with, with you, too. And I would say, no, he, I don't think that's possible. So I, I have a friend right now who's been incarcerated for quite some time. And I, I still don't really believe that that was the right judgment on, against him. It was supposed to be for statutory rape, you know, as a young child. As mild and kind as he has presented himself. Right? I wouldn't think that he would do something like that. Of course, you know, being humans, I know it's not impossible that he would, you know, do anything like that. But not knowing for sure, I can, I, I'm, I'm saying, I, I don't believe it. But there he is. He's spending time, you see. So if, the, if an adversary or if, if, if a person is justified, they... they they're still an adversary because they are against you, 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 you okay? It, it doesn't mean that they're just evil, you know, all the time. But it's an opposition to you. And if they have the justification, then, then they overcome, and, and you have to pay the um, full price. But nevertheless, being in the church of God, God will see us through all of these kind of difficulties, Right? You, we, we have Joseph as to be reminded of. He was incarcerated. It was a wrong judgment. But look where he ended up, though. See? Look where he ended up. I, I think that was, that was wonderful, you know, that uh, he, he bore that patiently, not knowing what tomorrow will, will bring. But yet still, he was victorious. So that's what I'm saying. You're going to have things happen. You will be accused of things that you did not do. And sometimes it will be true. You, you're accused of something or whatever. And you, you have to deal with it the best way you can. Now, how do, how do you deal with that? You first go to God in prayer. Ask the Savior to help you. He's willing to aid you and help you. You say, call on me while I'm near. So, yes, that's the responsibilities of the church. Okay, so to, to the elders, let's go to 1 Peter 5, verse 8 and 9. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 and 9. Okay. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, okay, who is he? The devil. He didn't just turn against God. He's doing what he wants to do, and he's your ad adversary also. So don't, and don't, don't agree with him. Don't, don't get with him, because he will remain your adversary. He will never be your friend. The devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. And that's all he does. There's no righteousness in him. If he gives you something, is believe me, it's not for you, it's for him. See, so he's going to get some glory out of this. And then you will fall. What did he do with Judas? He inspired Judas to do what he did, and then he left. And Judas, you know, came to himself and realized how he messed up. And he couldn't stand himself. Couldn't stand it. See, the devil don't care about you. Not at all. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. You're not by yourself. The devil messes with everybody. Mm -hmm. He might send his little uh, demons out 
uh, at first, you know, there'd be legions of demons against you, you know, and whatnot. But if he feel like it's time to really work a, a special work, he'll come himself and do that. But imagine him having legions of demon, demons with different ideas in your mind. You're trying to, sh you, and, and you don't, and most people, you know, the average person don't try to shake them off because they don't believe in demons and devils and whatnot. They just have ideas in their mind. And, uh, with some of the things that mankind have gone through, they, they wonder, you know, why is all this happening in their lives? Because the adversary is working and they don't acknowledge him. Just like they don't acknowledge God. Who is he? That's not in it. So, we find in Egypt that the king said that. Who is he? I already have gods, and my gods are powerful. So he had his trust in his gods. And uh, one thing I wanted to say uh, on the ad in concerning that, you know, can you imagine you having a god that looks like an animal? Because the gods of Egypt, they're represented by what? Cats and all kinds of things. Do you look like a cat? The scripture says we are made in the image of God and we look like him. We are to be called his children and be brought into his kingdom to rule with him on the throne. He'll be our father. Jesus is our brother. Why would you serve a God that looked like an animal? I'm wondering, but people today serve gods that look like animals with horns coming out of their head. Don't you remember how they used to draw pictures of the devil before? He was a red man with horns and a big old long tail. Why would, and, and the pitchfork, why would you serve something like that? But people do. They sure do. We don't look like that. And our God, he made us to look like him. Because he's going to let us be with him, not as animals like a pet on the throne, Right? He said we will rule with him. And we, we can call him father. I like that. I don't like no animal to be my God. No. We experiment on animals and experiment on humans too. But we want our God to lead and guide our lives so that we could be what he want us to be and then sit on the throne with him. I think that's so wonderful. I, I don't understand how people can think in terms of uh, recognizing God and then totally reject him and some of them want to worship a, a, a creature that looks like an animal. I don't, I don't get that at all. But they do. Yep, there are strange things in this world, but God has called us out of this world to not take uh, part in it. Why? Because the, the world practice abominations and filth, evil, backbiters, scheming on other people. God told us not to be like that. Why? Because you are an adversary. You are against what is right and good and holy. Don't be against what is right. How would you like if the judge just don't, didn't like you and had a judgment against you? You go to, you're in court. The judge just do not like you and he just sentenced you to, to some jail time. 
sisters out of his heart. Well, that's what the devil does. He doesn't care. We want God who's going to bring us justice, peace, and joy in our lives. He made us for that purpose. So why do we reject him? Why? He said, we don't believe in your God. We don't see why you believe in him either. But I believe. I trust in God. Who else had um, problems? Huh? Who, had, who faced adversity? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 16. First Corinthians 16, verse 9, Paul says, For a great and effective door has opened to me. As you go different places, there are places, people who will open the doors for him, you know, and God could be glorified in the area and whatnot. And that's wonderful. But he said many, and there are many adversaries against the work that he was doing and the truth that he was teaching. Who were most of these adversaries? They were Jews. Most of them, know that was the adversity that he faced. And, but Paul had a zeal for Judah. Oh, that they would just recognize the truth. All of his efforts, he would say, it's worthwhile. Well, I guess if he can just give one or two, that would be good enough. We don't know how many came into the faith, but he, but, but he did have helpers. He had some that went against him. Who, who, who was that? Diotrephes? Right? But he had others who helped him in his ministry. And because of the words that he wrote, his words reached all the way to the 21st century. <laughs> and a lot of people of being drawn to God by the words that were written by the prophets and the apostles. And Paul wrote those letters. And they have been drawing people to God. Now we have what is called Messianic Jews. Some of them are deciding to say yes to Jesus Christ and believe that Jesus is Lord. See? So his words did not go out in vain. It's been drawing people to God. So I think that's, that's, that's wonderful to do a work, and it, doesn't, it, it does a little work while you're here on earth, but then later on it just opens up wide. And many others are drawn to God. Many people we don't even know. I, I think that's wonderful. You're thinking of the churches of God. We are the uh, Church of God Ministries International. Real small uh, com com compared to United and some of the others. And we don't know all of those people. The important thing is they're a part of this work of getting the truth out into mankind. That though you go through adversity and tribulations, God is with you. We're saying that in our lessons that God will not forsake his people who can be victorious over the adversaries. 
Now the church of God will, will see tribulations. John 16, verse 33. The church seeing tribulations and problems. John 16, verse 33 says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Because God is the prince, Jesus is the prince of peace, right? Because in the world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus went through all that he went through for us. The trials and tribulations, the mockings and the scorning and all. God did not spare him. He was lifted up for our transgressions on that tree. Yes, he hung on the tree for us. So he knew what he was doing because that was the plan for mankind. Let's go, go to Hebrews 5, verse 8 and 9. Hebrews 5, the Son of God. Though he was a son, yet he learned what? Obedience, Obedience from the things, right? By the things which he suffered. Isn't that one of the important things that God wants man to do is to obey? So we are learning things as we go forward, suffering the tribulations and trials of this world. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now, obedience is important. And he even learned it. So going through the trials and tribulations of life, don't let it beat you down. Call on God to help you through whatever it is that you're going through because he will do it. Yes, even Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. He had adversities um, or oh, ad adversaries who did not love him. So they misused and abused him. Then his friends did not protect him. What happened? Peter tried to stop him with Malchus with that sword, but he was stopped, right? They didn't help him. They all ran. Jesus had to face this pretty, almost by, pretty much by himself. As far as human beings were concerned, the Father was still with him at this particular point in time. So it's important for us to recognize that as we go through the adversities and problems in our life, God will be with us. Jesus suffered. We may have to suffer. Don't fall apart. Endure. Yeah, oh, they all ran. He didn't get no help. But they weren't supposed to, you know. Jesus was appointed to this particular point in time to do what he did for all mankind. And what he, what he did, you know, the redemption, the sanctification, salvation, that's going to work for the individuals all the way up until the time he comes back. And then during the thousand years of his reign, right? So he did not suffer and go through these things in vain. He's making certain things right for mankind. Yes, he'll make it right if nobody else can. So believers can become victorious. You know where Jesus is, right? At the right hand of the Father. 
But believers can also be victorious. Let's go to 1 John 5. Verse 4 and 5. No, don't, ex don't, don't try to stop the inevitable things. You want to go through them and be victorious. Verse 4 and 5 says, For uh, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith, to believe in God. And trust him. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And that's another important thing that we need for this day and time to believe in the Son of God and all that he has done. Because through him, we're not defeated. Through him, we can go on to new life in Christ, walking in his ways, knowing that he has perfected us or made us blameless before his throne. So God is wonderful in what he's doing. So that he, uh, his plan, like I said before, is still working. Sometimes it seems like it's not because we go through so much. Pain and suffering, but it's working. Why? Because he has established salvation for you, for us. That includes me. Washing away our sins and cleansing us that we might be blameless before his throne. That's right. So we can overcome this world of sin and shame. Overcome lawlessness that we see from top to bottom in any nation. Any nation. So let's look at the, uh, I'm, I'm thinking more about rulers now, so that's why I put Luke 18. Let's go there. In here, the parable of the Persistent widow, right? Y'all you know, remember that story that goes here. Luke 18, I'm going to go from verse 1 through verse 8. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not, see that I said that? Don't faint, don't lose heart. You won't make it if you faint and fall apart. Okay, so keep praying and fasting to humble ourselves before God. Okay, saying, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. That's, that's terrible, isn't it? You're under the, uh, the thumb of a person who don't care about you and don't care about God either. That's terrible. See? Now, there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my, what? My adversary. So she had an adversary, and she needed justice. Okay? And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God, unfortunately, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wearies me. Ooh. Work on his nerve. Work on it, baby. <laughs> Wake him up. The man came there to do a job. He didn't come to sleep and just look cute, right? Wake up and avenge like you're supposed to. And act like, at least act like you care about mankind even though you don't, right? Those are the things that we have to watch out for is people who do not really care about, man, about their fellow man. And instead of trying to help you, they try to ignore you. No, we don't want that type of person to sit in any seat of judgment 
or execution of, uh, uh, let's see, what, we, what were the three branches we have? Judicial, executive, and legislative branch. We want them to sit in those seats and care about the people and do what they were supposed to do. <coughs> we pay them, don't we? So they're sitting up there making money or you're not gonna do anything? Hmm. It happens now, you know. Watch it, be careful. Then the law said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? God is the just judge, right? Right? Though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he uh, really find faith on the earth? Mm -hmm. He's going to find some. But most of mankind will, 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 will face uh, a sentence of death because they don't want God. But don't you want justice? Call on God. Do you want peace? Call on God. You can't always call on government to bring these things to pass, to defend you against all enemies. But you can depend on God. We are promised to overcome. By faith, the punishment of our enemies will come in God's time, in God's own way. Anyone who sins is ultimately sinning against God, and the enemy of God will be placed under the feet of Jesus and eventually punished. So notice the contemplations of the sons of Korah who knew where their victory came from. Let's go to Psalms. Psalms 44. Yeah, you can depend on God. He's just. He's a wonderful counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Those are wonderful things about God. You can't say that about man. Mm-mm. Man has frailties. Psalms 44, verse 4 through 6. You are my king and my God, who decrees victories for Jacob. Though you, no, through you, we put back our enemies. You see that? He can become victorious over those enemies. Through your name, We trample our foes. Some of these words are getting to be hard to see. Okay. I put no trust in my boat. My sword does not bring me victory. Right? But you give us victory over our enemies. You put our adversaries to shame. In God, we make our boasts all day long and we will praise your name forever and that's what we need to do be obedient don't cause God to decide that he's going to bring an enemy against you be faithful unto God he wants to know if he's going to have faith on the earth when he returns and we should be faithful knowing all of these things, and we acknowledge him as our king. Don't forget, we have a father and we have the son, but they are one. Okay, count them together. Can you say the same thing like they did, that he was my God? We need to know who to call for help. God is all in all for us. When we are attacked by anyone, we do not know what the outcome will be. Our fears come upon us. They assail us and may weaken us and cause us to run and hide. And we try to think of what we can do in the situation we are in. Do we fight? Do we run? Do we curse? Or get loud so we can, can win a, 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 
a, a discussion of, of a sort. Uh -huh. How can something good come out of it if we make the wrong decision? Always ask God to direct your path and he can make things all right for you. You can be this stronger and grow in Christ. Have you thought to thank God for adversaries or adversity? I, don't, I wouldn't think to, to thank him for those kind of things. But look, notice that you learn from every situation just like Jesus did. Okay? And if you never go through anything, then you can, can't learn anything. See? If you don't go through anything, you don't, there's no learning curve here. Right? And when you get old, no one can ask you for knowledge or wisdom for you do not have any experience yourself. Don't run from life. Face it. It's always going to be a challenge somewhere. Someone wrote a song that says, Lord, don't move that mountain. Give me strength to climb it. Please don't move that stumbling block. But lead me around it. I, want to, I, I, I need to experience. I need to get the understanding and know that there's going to come a time when I can't move the rocks and the stones out of my life. I need to call on you. But I learned some things from every experience. And as you go through each situation, ponder what you can learn from it. You might be able to help someone else later on. It's, be, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to be able to help somebody, especially children. So it is God who will give us the victory. Trust him. He wants you to overcome and be with him. You see, because that was the plan from the beginning, right? From the beginning. So as we study and know and understand what God is doing, then we can say, yes, Lord, because we want to follow him rather than the adversary who does not care about you. We want to follow the one who cares, and God does. So trust him and allow him to help us through all adversity because we can be victorious through God.